Distinguished guests, please welcome the Secretary of State of the United States, Antony J. Blinken. Good morning, everyone. Wow, it is wonderful to see this incredible auditorium uh, full. I think uh, hopefully uh, we managed to get a little breakfast before this. But um, I'm here simply to say this. Welcome to the African and Diaspora Young Leaders Forum. Um, Your Excellencies, President Way of Liberia is in the house. Yeah. President Matabio of Sierra Leone in the house. See you. Thank you. Thank you both for traveling to Washington for the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. It means a great deal to have this time in person with you. And I also saw in the House Greg Meeks, the Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. There may be some other members of Congress here as well. It's wonderful to have you this morning. So to everyone joining us this morning, members of the African diaspora, African and American youth leaders, students in the United States and Africa who are tuning in virtually, thank you for all that you do to strengthen the bonds between African countries and the United States. Now, it is fitting that we are meeting here at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, a national treasure. On its top floor, and I don't know if you've had the opportunity uh, to visit, but on the top floor of the museum, there's an exhibit called Cultural Expressions. It explores, in part, the contributions of the African diaspora and how its members have shaped American culture and life through fashion, the arts, dance, language, food, music. Across the exhibit and museum, we see the unique culture in objects like a recipe book brought by Pierre uh, Tiam, a, a great chef who brought the flavors of Senegal to New York City through his beloved Taranga restaurant, or a flag of the United States whose colors have been replaced by the colors of the Pan-African flag titled the African-American flag, which has served as a symbol of African-American and African pride and protest movements throughout our history. As this museum shows, the United States continues to be enriched immeasurably by the African diaspora, from the piercing comedy of Trevor Noah, who we will miss on The Daily Show, <laughs> to the Ulte of Thames, who I happen to have on my phone, <laughs> to the speed skating of Mama Bine, who I don't have on my phone, <laughs> among so many others. Often, we see members of the diaspora return to the countries to which they're connected and empower people there. This past August, I was in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I met with um, someone who may be familiar to some of you, a certain NBA Hall of Famer, Dikembe Mutombo, whose foundation has provided high-quality health care to more than 30,000 patients, regardless of their economic status. I could also say Dukumbe is very, very tall. <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful person. The importance of the diaspora to the past, to the present, to the future of both African nations and the United States is why this is one of the very first events of the Africa Leaders Summit. Uh, earlier this year in South Africa, I had an opportunity to set out the administration's new strategy for Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a strategy rooted in one key word, partnership, and in recognition that we can't solve any of our shared priorities unless we work together. And it's a strategy that recognizes the immense role that the African diaspora and young people will play in shaping and strengthening that partnership. And in fact, that's exactly what you're already doing. Uh, back in August, I had a chance to meet with members of the diaspora uh, and African and American youth leaders right here in Washington to hear a little bit about some of the work that they were doing. One young leader who's mobilized climate finance to make the water sector more resilient in South Africa is now sharing the lessons that she learned at a U.S. government agency. Another, fresh off her experience fighting infectious disease in Malawi, was sharing her insights with nonprofits and businesses in the United States. Others were expanding educational opportunities for children, conducting environmental research, creating job opportunities for youth in both African countries and the United States, and demonstrating exactly why the diaspora is such an unparalleled asset 
for people on both continents. It's these interconnections, the back and forth, and the benefits that flow to African nations and the United States alike that is so incredibly powerful. The United States is committed to ensuring that young people can continue to bring their talents and hard work to the benefit of people across the continent and to the benefit of people in the United States. Uh, we've got a number of programs that are doing just that. Programs like the Young African Leaders Initiative and through our economic development programs like the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs Program. Now, since its inception in 2019, that program has provided more than 5,400 women throughout Africa with the training and the networks that they need to start and to scale small businesses. Over the next few days, we will be announcing additional investments to make it easier for students to participate in exchange programs between our countries to increase trade opportunities for members of the uh, African diaspora and to support African entrepreneurs and small businesses. Each of these investments is guided by one overarching goal, to continue building our partnership so that we can better address the shared challenges we face, and ultimately, we can build a safer, more secure, more prosperous future for all of us. And now, I have the great pleasure and the honor of introducing His Excellency President Waya of, uh, of Liberia. Now, President uh, Waya, I happen to have been uh, in Qatar for the World Cup. And I didn't get an opportunity to speak to you in, in detail then, but I wanted to thank you for all you've done to strengthen the bonds between Liberia and the United States, <laughs> including, including through, through your support of the Liberian diaspora. And thanks for all that you and your family have done to support that goal, too, uh, including quite literally by scoring a few goals. <laughs> so I was there, first match between the United States and Wales, and I got to cheer your son, Timothy, scoring the first goal for the United States men's soccer team in the World Cup. But the best part of that was turning around and getting a quick look at your face as you watched your son score that goal. And I could see the extraordinary pride uh, that was there uh, and an entire stadium cheering him on. So, I guess the apple just doesn't fall too far from the tree in this case. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of Liberia, thank you very much. The Honorable Antonio J. Blankens, Secretary of State of the United States of America, Excellencies, colleagues, my esteemed young African leaders, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I bring you warm greetings and best wishes from the friendly people of the Republic of Liberia. It is indeed an honor to join my colleagues from Africa to participate in this year's U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. On behalf of the government and people of Liberia, and in my own name, I would like to extend heartfelt appreciation to the Honorable Joseph R. Biden, Jr. President of the United States of America and the government and people of the United States for the invitation to be in attendance and participate in this important summit here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Liberia has a long and historic relationship of the United States, which has led us to having common positions on issues such as democracy, human rights, 
global peace and security. We hold the views that this summit will strengthen our partnership and increase our commitment to foster strong cooperation in seeking the broad interests of our respective countries in particular and the war at large. Liberia believes that such engagement between Africa and the United States will improve and strengthen bilateral and multilateral relationships, foster peace and security on the continent of Africa. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, with millions of African descendants and migrants in the diaspora, there is no doubt that this is a vast reservoir of talent, training, expertise, and financial capacity which must and should be utilized to enhance the advancement and development of our continent. This collaborative effort will serve as the bridge connecting Africans in the diaspora back to their collective roots and cultural identities. It is therefore our responsibility as leaders to recognize and acknowledge the significance of these many millions of our compatriots living in the diaspora communities whose contributions are necessary for the growth and development of our continent. Although physically separated from the motherland, they have a major influence on the social, economic, cultural, and political landscape of their respective countries. We should not be overlooked or underestimated. In recognition of the value of our Liberian diaspora community, at the inception of my administration nearly five years ago, I embarked upon the process of removing restricted laws to encourage the Liberian diaspora to contribute more to the development of our country. Today, I am pleased to inform you that in July this year, I signed into law an act authorizing dual citizenship and allowing women <laughs> and allowing women to pass citizenship to their children. By so doing, my administration has now removed all legal barriers which had prevented natural born Liberians from rightfully resuming citizenships of the land of their ancestors. Once a Liberian, always a Liberian. <laughs> this is a demonstration of my government's commitment to ensure that our diaspora is not left out in the national reconstruction and development of Liberia. We consider the Liberian diaspora community as a valuable asset to our nation's growth and development. And their full participation is an important part of the nation building process. Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Africa's future ought to be bright. We have the potential to turn around the green outlook of the continent that is presented in the news daily, with more than 60 percent of Africans being young people, we have the demographic dividend capable of making our region responsive to the needs of its people. The role young people and the general African diaspora must play in addressing the needs of the continent must be through innovation, investment, and knowledge transfer. It is often said in Africa that young people are our future leaders, but I have observed that not much opportunities are created 
to allow them to reach their full potential. This has made a growing number of them to seek opportunities here in the West, where they have acquired quality education and useful skills in order to contribute to the development and advancement of society. I believe that young people are capable of conquering the war if given a place to stand. From the poor and the humble background growing up in the slum of Gibraltar in Liberia, I managed through hard work, discipline, and determination to climb to the top of my career as a professional footballer. While pursuing my professional careers in the diaspora myself, I took by many investments to my home country, Liberia, also Zanzibar, Cote d'Ivoire, and other parts of Africa. I invested in many businesses, and I invested in human capital by supporting many young people in acquiring education to enable them to advance their lives and have a livelihood. And also today, I say to the youth of Africa, you can also succeed in your chosen fields of endeavors if you are prepared to be resilient, disciplined, and determined. Africa's African government must also create the enabling environment and a requisite framework that will allow our young people in the diaspora to contribute to the education and innovation to the transformation of our beloved continent. Our brothers and sisters in the diaspora as indispensable partners in the development aspiration of our various country, we must welcome them. We must embrace them. We must recognize them. Africans in the diaspora and Africans in Africa are one people. We, we can succeed if we allow peace to reign, and we can succeed if we lay the framework for our young people to have a smooth transition in the democratic process. There is no doubt in my mind that the young population of Africa has a significant role in whichever direction Africa takes. So, my distinguished African diaspora brothers and sisters, I would like to invite you to join us in helping to build a new Africa where peace, unity, democracy, human rights, comprehensive freedom, tolerance, togetherness, cooperation, reconciliation, equal opportunity for all, so that growth and sustainable development will be the cornerstone and foundation for the future of Africa. God bless Africa. God bless Liberia. God bless the United States of America. May God bless us all. I thank you. Please welcome Congressman Gregory Meeks, Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Good morning. Uh, Y'all was excited. I saw everybody waiting to get in here. You know that this is a big moment. You know that this is an important moment. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Let me begin by thanking uh, Secretary Blinken and the Biden administration, and the Department of State in particular, 
for holding this important summit and inviting me to be a part of it. To His Excellencies, uh, all of the African heads of states that are here, we just heard from President Weir, and I just add he's really important to me in the sense that he talked about his son, Timothy, who's called the first goal for the U.S. Well, in a democracy, all politics is local. I want you to know that Timothy lives in the 5th Congressional District of New York. So the most important thing for me in a democratic world is to make sure I get his vote. So I was back there talking to his dad about making sure I had his son vote and said we will give him an award when he comes back to New York after working for our United States men's uh, uh, team, World Cup team. And let me also give a warm thanks to Secretary Bunch for providing this remarkable and most fitting venue. The National Museum for African American History offers the perfect backdrop to celebrate the strong and vibrant African diaspora that represents the deep bonds between the United States and the African continent. There are deep bonds, many of things of which we have to overcome because those of us who are of African descent were forced here. We didn't come on the Mayflower. And there are bonds that we've got to recognize and talk about. So I'm honored to be here with all of you to kick off this very historic week, this historic summit. You know, throughout my tenure in Congress, I have consistently advocated for a U.S. foreign policy that aims to strengthen our relationship with, the Af with our African partners by drawing upon the immense talent and diverse experiences of the African diaspora, but especially its youth. Look, I am the first, and I hate sometimes saying the first, but I am the first African American to chair the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And I say that because I know that that means an additional responsibility that I have. And so I told all of my colleagues that should they elect me chair, I wanted them to know that we would be moving Africa from the back burner to the front burner. We will put Africa on the map so that it is not just being heard by subcommittees, but by the full committee, so that everybody knows the importance and significance of making sure that we are engaging with the youngest and fastest growing continent on the planet called Earth. And that's why I applaud the Biden-Harris administration's African strategy which rightly points to our African diaspora as a source of strength to be successful. And I believe our partnership with African countries must be based on respect for the rich culture, Dionism, and sense of community that the diaspora brings to the table. One example, sitting in the audience somewhere, I know I saw him in the background, we're gonna talk, but there's a young man that I met in Brooklyn, New York. And he decided that he had to do something for his country. First, he was in the United States as a citizen that was sworn, sworn in, but he had a feeling to go back home to his roots. And he went back and he became the ambassador to Sierra Leone, Ambassador Sadiq Y. It's that connection that is so important. So it tells us that we should recall and remember that the sense of community, and this is what I'm talking about, includes all of us, African Americans, African descendants of slaves, 
African immigrants with direct ties to the continent who have become among the most successful diaspora groups in the United States of America. It is a community that includes a growing list of people who have achieved some of the highest levels of success and service and all those who continue to thrive and help build a more perfect union. And so when I meet with African officials, thought leaders, and entrepreneurs, I encourage the high esteem in which they hold the United States of America. And I am reminded of how important it is to use opportunities like this summit to amplify the success of the diaspora and to highlight the impact members of the diaspora have on our foreign policy and agenda. And I'm also reminded, talking about that close connection that we have, that the United States Congress itself has been impacted in a positive way in talking about, because on the committee of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, we have someone from Africa who stands and talks and talks about Africa. You all will hear from her shortly, and Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. So I'm very proud of the work that Ilhan and I have done in Congress to capitalize on this impact through legislation like the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act and the Young African Leaders Initiative and Prosper Africa. The United States is forging a clear path toward empowering African diaspora leaders, including women and young entrepreneurs. Let me say this as I close. Nothing happens without young people. Nothing happens without young people because you have the vision of what you want your lives to be about. Oftentimes, as we stand here in the African American History Museum, I think and look as you go around, you'll see that those young, le those leaders that propelled those up here to make me to be where I am, they were young. Dr. King himself was only 24 years old when he started the movement. So there's nothing that you can't accomplish. And what I also say to the administration, and what you should be saying to me and to whoever represent you, if you're here in the United States, is the first thing that the United States has to do. We've got to show up on the continent. We've got to be there. We've got to invest, and we've got to utilize the skills and the ability of all of us. It makes a difference. It is how we can make tomorrow better than today or yesterday. It lies in many of y'all's hands because you are special if you're in this room. There's a reason for you to be in this room. If there wasn't a reason, you wouldn't be here. If you weren't interested in making a difference, you wouldn't be here. If you wasn't ready to stand and say that we're going to make sure that the fastest growing continent, the youngest continent, is not going to be the one that stands up when we talk about saving this planet with climate and others, you wouldn't be here. You're here because I know that you feel an abiding passion to make a difference to help save this planet. That's what this is all about. I know for me, as I introduce our next head of state. Something for me always was missing. You know, growing up in New York and going, I always would meet someone, some of my other friends, some of my European friends, some of my Chinese friends. I, I talked and I listened to them, and my Italian friends would always talk about Italy and where they were from in Italy. My Irish friends would always talk about Ireland and where they're from in Ireland. My Jewish friends would always talk about Israel and where they were from in Israel. And I really didn't have much to say other than I knew that I was from Africa, which was important. So I took all of Africa. <laughs> but there was a deep something missing. And with technology today that all of you young people know better than most, they have this thing now called DNA. 
So I decided to get a DNA test so I could try to cure what was missing when I talked to other friends of other nationalities. And that DNA test came back that I am from the Mende tribe of Sierra Leone. And all of a sudden, I felt this real connection. And so when I went back home to my motherland and met with President Bill, there was an instant connection. We talked about his history. We talked about the history of Sierra Leone. We talked about the history of the, the Mende tribe. He talked about the struggles that he's having and has had of trying to make a democracy. So what we can talk about is young people, entrepreneurs, human rights, education, democracy, and inclusion of all, especially women in the society. And all that his focus is is making sure that that continues and have election after election so the voices of the people are heard. And I, each and every time, has now tried to make sure that we send people to different places, to different countries, to make sure that they invest on the continent. It's an opportunity for those of you who are entrepreneurs here to do two things, and you don't get a chance to do it often. One, you can do the right thing. Investing in Africa is the right thing to do. <laughs> Second, you can help people on the continent by working closely together, and you can earn a living doing it. You can make money, too. You can do it all with vision and foresight, and that's the stage that President Bill is setting in Sierra Leone. We are President Weah talk about it in Liberia. I heard President Sal talk about it last night, and all of the heads of states around from the continent of Africa are focused on doing just that. So it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce His Excellency, the President, of my mother home country, <laughs> the president of Sierra Leone, <laughs> President Pio. Good morning, everyone. I hope we are still awake. <laughs> I've been struggling this morning. I only came in yesterday. <laughs> Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, first, I bring you warm greetings from the Republic of Sierra Leone, my country, and that of uh, Gregory Mix. Is my citizen in the United States. I'm very excited to be in the same room with so many people, with leaders, policy makers, policy drivers, and most importantly, young leaders from both sides of the Atlantic. I am coming from the other part of the Atlantic. And therefore, I want to use this opportunity to thank President Biden and the administration for this unique opportunity of convening with African leaders now and African leaders of the future. At several points in these discussions this morning, I am sure speakers will highlight why cooperation among Africa of now, the Africa of the future, and the African diaspora and the United States are vital. There is a burning question, and to that question, I have an answer. 
does Africa matter? I will state the assertion of the United Nations that Africa contains 30% of the Earth's mineral reserves, including 40% of the world's gold and 40% of its chromium and platinum, not to mention an even greater or higher percentage of rare earth metals. And these are very much indispensable for developing and processing new and emerging technologies. Add that to 12% of the world's oil reserve and 8% of the world's natural gas reserve, plus the largest and most diverse climate ecosystem, and you will know that the world cannot make the progress it needs to make without Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, the future belongs to Africa's youth. The youth are Africa's biggest assets. We must invest in them to build the skills and encourage entrepreneurship while providing access to the financial resources necessary to unlock the creativity and unleash the power of their business enterprises. As a quick aside, I must hasten also to add that Africa and Africans were critical to the success of the first industrial revolution. They involuntarily provided centuries of labor to power that industrial revolution. They were primarily recipients of the second and third industrial revolutions. With the fourth industrial revolution looming and holding such immense prospects for Africa's socioeconomic transformation, are we consciously planning for Africa's participation in making the right policies and digital infrastructure and investment at scale? That leads me, most importantly, to human capital development of Africa. By 2050, it is projected that one in three young people will live in Africa. By 2030, it is further projected that half of Africa's population will be less than 25. So what do we do with these numbers? How do we make shared investment in this youth budge? Collectively, I believe we must embark on innovative programs and financing approaches to accelerate job creation for the youth in Africa and unlock economic prosperity from Africa's demographic assets. In Sierra Leone, we have prioritized investing in education, healthcare, and food security. Providing every child in Sierra Leone, especially girls, with free quality education, we equip them with the skills they require for participation in an inclusive and sustainable global economy. In Sierra Leone, girls studying STEM disciplines are guaranteed tuition-free education from nursery through university under my administration. We have also passed progressive laws that enrich our society and our democracy, including gender equality and women's empowerment bill, abolished the death penalty, repealed criminal libel laws, and opened up spaces for journalism and civil society, decongested our prisons, clamped down hard on sexual and gender-based violence and corruption, and many others. I believe an educated population and a well-governed society where governments invest in people is essential for building and consolidating a vibrant, free, progressive, inclusive, and just society. Furthermore, an educated population, we also 
be well primed to tackle the shared global challenges that have manifested themselves lately in lethal combination, global financial crisis, disruption, disruptions, including food insecurity, international and national health, migration, especially of youth populations, the impact of emerging technologies on our societies and the persistent risk of climate change. These challenges present opportunities to transform our world for, a for the current and future generations. With the ongoing World Cup, maybe it, uh, it, it is most appropriate to draw attention to a quote by the game's greatest legend, Pele, who once said, no individual can win a game alone by himself. Therefore, I say that no one country can solve the world's numerous interlocking challenges. Our recognition that the world is helplessly interlinked and that we face interlocking challenges is a good start. I am therefore delighted and grateful for this gathering today. Education and innovation sector financing will help address key deficit among Africa's young people and have multiplier effects on economic growth. I believe in education for personal development, community development, and national development, and for building more resilient economies and democracies. Together, we can think about structured ways of mobilizing, harnessing, and, and, and transferring diaspora resources and the tremendous results of diaspora skills and knowledge collectively. We can develop adaptable models for green investment and just energy transitions. Together, we can develop better food production systems to tackle food insecurity and help mitigate biodiversity loss. Together, we can build a more robust and resilient healthcare system. But all of that starts from open dialogues like this one today. Henry Ford said it very well. Coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress. And working together is success. <laughs> we can do quite a lot together through productive partnerships as governments, multilateral institutions, the private sector, civil society, and coalition of young people such as we have today. I hope this convention is a promising start. I've said before that most transformative a nation or world-changing events begin when we make bold choices. Ask why not and let those bold choices happen. Strong partnerships are all stra and where all strategies and goals are well aligned and transparent from the outset are therefore critical. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, the African youth of today are brave, resilient, innovative, entrepreneurial, and more determined to succeed and achieve financial independence than in previous generations. African youths are increasingly striving for the transformation they want to see across all the sectors, be it in politics, business, research, development, or ICT. The future of Africa's youth does not lie in the migration to the west or in the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. The future of Africa's youth and its economic development lies in a prosperous Africa where we invite all of you to come. Thank you.